If you would rise, if you are able, for the scripture reading. From Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, and then 11 through 13. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. And in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. In him, we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Okay, Yep. Yeah, hold the whole bit down. We'll have a yeah. Is that okay? Yes. I try. It's my magnetic personality. Anyway, who do you follow? And I'm hearing some Texas Tech and some OU and some various things. A lot of people are proud, some are not this week. Well, <laughs> A lot of people follow an awful lot of social media and, and celebrities and things. I know someone who comes home from work each evening, and she sits down, looks at her iPad until about 7 o'clock, then she goes to bed, or goes into the bedroom, and then she comes out the next morning, looks at her iPad until it's time to go to work again, pretty much ignoring the husband and three children that she has, but she keeps up with the Kardashians. <laughs> And there's so many people that are following celebrities, their lives and their likes, and they forget to establish their own identities. I'm on Facebook. I like to just look at pictures from friends and family, and I can kind of keep up with people that lead on some of the trips that we take. And I did recently reconnect with a half-sister, so there are some advantages to, to the social media aspects of life. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's posted on social media that's not fit for human consumption, especially not followers of Jesus. And we need to be careful who we follow and with whom we identify. Now last year we did a study on a book called Not a Fan. And it asks the question, are you going to be a fan, your cheerleader? Go Jesus! Go Jesus! Go out and save old souls. <laughs> or are you going to be a follower and pick up the cross like it says in Matthew 16, 24, and actually follow his teachings. And I can tell you that after following down a lot of wrong roads and looking for love in the wrong places for a number of years, I decided to follow the one who sacrificed himself on a cross to save me from a darkness I don't ever want to go back to. And no human power could have accomplished that. And I certainly tried. I even once read a book called The Last Self-Help Book You Will Ever Need. <laughs> it did not help. <laughs> this self-help book actually works. According to Proverbs 3 verses uh, 5 and 6, this is what happens when you follow Jesus. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your paths acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Then, in Mark chapter 8, 34, Jesus tells us, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
deny. For somebody that's all into self and instant gratification, that deny word is a four-letter word. And so I just said, I'm a follower, but I have an confession to make. The Sunday before, Ash Wednesday, I'm thinking, Flint is coming. I'm going to have to give up something. That means I'm going to have to deny myself something. So I'm kind of mulling over, and I wonder what would be the easiest thing for me to give up so it's not too stressful in my person, right? <laughs> well, I went over to read my daily devotional, and it referred me to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. And it says, So then let's also run the race that is laid out in front of us, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let's throw up any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that trips us up, and fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame, for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him and sat down at the right side of God's throne. Think about the one who endured such opposition from sinners that you won't be discouraged and you won't give up. I think I could do without chocolate for a few weeks. <laughs> we seem to be in a world where people are lost and where so many people believe that they simply don't fit in and they're searching for a sense of belonging to someone or something. And they try so hard to follow someone else's behavior, the latest fashions, the trends, or whatever popular expectations from their peers, that they don't know who they are. How many of you remember Annette Funicello? Yeah, at least you're willing to remember that you remember, that you remember that for the cello. Well, we're the same age. We're the same age, I should say. And, you know, she became a famous in 1955, for those of you who aren't old enough to know that. Uh, and she was part of the Mickey Mouse Club, and she went on to make movies, and she dated Frankie Avalon. <laughs> I was so jealous of Annette Punicello. I wanted what she had. I wanted to be her. Well, you know, life happens, and life went on. And in 1987, Annette was diagnosed with muscular sclerosis. And in, in 2004, she lost the ability to walk. And in 2009, she was no longer able to speak. And she lived in that condition until she passed away in April of 2013. So we need to be careful what we wish for. Some Christians today don't seem to know who they are because we've lost our identity. And the result of an identity crisis is that we've been conditioned to expect the ordinary and just the routine. Not only do we not expect a miracle, sometimes we don't even recognize it when it happens. But yet every day we see and we read about the power of prayer for healing and the things that people come out of a coma. And you can just read Pat's prayer list of the, of the things that we pray for these people and, and miraculous things happen. So I'll tell you about one little miracle that happened to me. A couple of years ago, Jerry and I flew into Zurich, Switzerland to go to the Christmas markets in Switzerland, Germany, and France. So we got into Zurich um, and we settled in the hotel and we went over to this huge train station thing that had all these Christmas markets inside. It was just glorious with the lights and the booths. Well, not too long after I got there, I had to go to the bathroom. So I look around and I see the sign, this is WC, sign for European bathroom, and I go down the escalator and I went into this huge basement and I'm wandering around trying to find something that closely resembles a bathroom and finally I find this little lady is sweeping the floor and she understood enough English to understand bathroom I guess. So she said to me, well the thing was, it was like a laundromat, all this great big glass. I thought, oh, found it. Went in, well there's a turnstile and a custodian who wants two Swiss francs. Now, I don't have two Swiss francs. I just have an urgency. <laughs> so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to go back across that basement, up that escalator, try to find Jerry, try to find some place where I can get the two Swiss francs, and I'm kind of mulling this over, and I kind of turn, and I get this tap. And I turned, and a man handed me two Swiss francs, and said, for the toilet. 
<laughs> yeah, you might not think that's much of a miracle. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, yes, it was. You know, and, and kind of another miracle, you guys may have read about um, the yeah, cruise ship that just floundered off the coast of Norway. That's the same ship on the same uh, trip that Jerry and I were on in January. You know, there but for the grace of God. And so God does take care of us. Another thing, you know, we've kind of been conditioned to, to believe that we're less than God says we are. But you know, in Christ, we're significant. When he died on that cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. And when we're not following or identifying with Christ, we don't think we have anything to offer. But in Christ, we're sufficient. Look at the stories of Moses, Jonah, Jeremiah, Esther, Tamar, ordinary people who performed an impossible task through the power of God. And as we follow Jesus, he empowers us to speak and act as he himself spoke and acted. Following Christ is one thing, but understanding how that changes our, the way we live is another. Understanding our true identity in Christ can greatly impact the way we live our lives. For instance, we stop chasing after the desires of our flesh, but instead seek to bring God glory in all areas of our lives. First John, Chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 say, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love, of the, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions, is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. If we're not looking to find our identity in Christ, we're looking to find it in something else. You know, Dustin has talked recently about being in the wilderness. We've all been in a wilderness of some kind over the years, whether it's anger or grief, resentments, addiction, guilt, all kinds of things that keep us in the wilderness. But when our identity is in the eternal things of Christ, we won't be crushed by our failures and our weaknesses, and we won't fall into pride from worldly success, or despair over disappointments or tragedies. We won't get lost seeking the attractive but empty things because Christ gives us a stable and eternal hope in a world of unstable hopelessness. When we follow Christ, we don't fear the future. If we have peace with God, we have nothing to fear on this earth. Our eternities are secure as adopted sons and daughters of Christ, so we don't need to fear financial collapse, losing our jobs, getting Ebola, or being ridiculed for our faith. Of course, these things aren't easy or painless, but we can have confidence that our Heavenly Father is sovereign over every moment of our life, and He will equip us for every single thing He ordains. Remember the phrase, God does not call the equipped? He equips. I said that wrong. God does not call the equipped, He equips the called. He bought us with the blood of His own Son, so that he could claim our identity and the righteousness of Christ. And we can trust that he will provide us with everything that we need in this world. Our identity in Christ gives us direct access to our Heavenly Father, who we can call on with confidence and complete trust. And as a follower of Christ, we don't need to judge or compare ourselves to others, even though I think we probably do sometimes. Comparing, self, comparing ourselves to those around us or judging the decisions that others make and just suck the life right out of us. Biblical convictions are hard and fast truths that God has given us in his word to show us the way to live. Personal convictions, however, are decisions that we make within our own families. And some may be right for some families, but some might be wrong for others. It's easy to confuse the two and judge others who have different convictions than ours. This can also create insecurity in our own choices due, our, due to our desire to please man over God. So let's be careful that we're not imposing our personal convictions on others as though we're more godly than they are. We can ask Christ for wisdom and be open to hear and discern others' perspectives without judgment and then walk in confidence that God is the only one we need to honor and please in our decisions. The other way we compare ourselves is to the gifts and blessings of others. 
and envy on all of us pops up from time to time. It's a human condition. We're all created for the purpose of glorifying God, but in the unique ways that God has created us. One person is filled with creativity, while another glorifies God with a beautiful voice. And it seems like there's some people with everybody, many, many gifts. And we have a lot of those people right here in this congregation. One person glorifies God as a CEO, while another glorifies him by doing custodial work for the church. One person glorifies God in the way they seek to raise their family, and another glorifies him in the way they use their singleness to serve him. We need to glorify God in the gifts and the talents he has uniquely chosen for us and not get lost in the pursuit of being something God never created us to be. And don't miss out on the blessing of serving Christ where you are and with what he has chosen for you. We shouldn't be surprised when suffering comes, although we certainly don't sit around expecting it or wanting it. The thing is, we can be confident that it will produce things of eternal value. Romans 8, 16-17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children that heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. God never said we wouldn't suffer. He just said he's going to be there with us when we do. If, we, if our identity is in Christ, then we're guaranteed that one day we will identify with him in his sufferings. Just as Christ's sufferings, sufferings were not hopeless and wasted, neither will ours be. Christ's sufferings defeated sin and death, and therefore we identify with him as he uses suffering to put sin to death in us, to make us reflect more of him. And not only does suffering sanctify us, but it assures us that after suffering with him for a while, we will one day be glorified with him. We can spend our lives bearing pain and suffering, or we can thank God for the times of reprieve because it makes the good times so much better. We can trust the seasons of suffering to Christ's great purpose in our lives, to identify with him and become more, become more like him. Jesus isn't just quietly asking us to follow him. He is shouting, hoping to get your attention. Are you saying, okay, Jesus, I will follow you tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be like the man in, in Luke 9 who said, I'll follow you, Jesus, but first I have to go home and do some things? The most dangerous part of following Jesus tomorrow isn't what you're going to lose between now and then. That's not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is that tomorrow might never come. The truth is, the longer you put him off, the more likely it is that following him will never happen. So don't wait until disaster strikes and you find that just having a little bit of religion isn't enough. And you have to learn through pain and suffering that Jesus becomes your only hope. The time is now. The time is today. Where do you find yourself seeking identity outside of Christ? Do you find yourself holding on to something and fear you'll be lost without it? And if you knew, or someone you knew before you became a Christian saw you today, what would they think of you? Would they say you're a fanatic? I know some people that knew me in my past life that probably would say that I don't deserve the life I had today, and thank God they're not in charge. <laughs> Praise God that he loves us enough to take our broken, rebellious hearts and because of the sacrifice of his son, offers us a new identity in Christ. And do you have any trouble with your identity? Or you're wondering who to follow? Stand next to or pick up a cross. Take time to quiet your soul. And then say out loud, this was for me. This was for me. Amen. So we'll get on with the next song.